Steve Eisen here again. This is February 17th, Friday, and this week's special guest is Attorney General Alan Wilson. Alan, good to, good to have you here with us. And, uh, you know, this is an eclectic group. We talk about a number of things. We also have Mary Louise Rich with Harvest Hope to make a presentation. So, if you're coming through South Carolina, please drop by the Shawnees here next to the airport. It's a great place to visit and to live here in Casey and West Columbia and this side of the river. So, Steve Eisen, until next week. Come by and see us. Alan, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Consulate. 
uh, to go to their embassy. That, that's, you know, it, it's, it's amazing how the federal government doesn't want you looking at someone's nationality for purposes of deportation, but they want you looking at it for um, purposes of their defense. And I just find it somewhat hypocritical, and that's one of the arguments we're going to bring up when we take this thing to court. Uh, the other thing is voter ID. Um, we have filed a complaint. We are um, challenging the Department of Justice's denial of South Carolina's photo ID under Section 5. Um, the federal government has misused Section 5, and we are calling, we're, we're basically calling them on the carpet on it. I know that other states have joined in this. Texas, for one, is calling in that they're basically saying Section 5 under the 64 Voting Rights Act. It's been misapplied and it's been perverted and it's and, it, and it's, it's it's bad. It's being it's being misused by the federal government. Um, Y'all have all heard about the, the voting dead. Um, <laughs> we, we, we've um, we've got I've asked SLED to actually go and look in line by line, person by person, the 900 dead people. If you remember the initial numbers uh, that were pro uh, provided to the um, Justice Department were 240,000 people, 239 specifically were not. Uh, well, ha had no photo ID, but were registered to vote, therefore they, their rights could potentially be infringed upon. We found out later that 37,000 of the 239 were dead, 92,000 of them were um, uh, people who went to another state, and that state notified us that they no longer live here, they turned in their license, and they are now registered in that state. Uh, so you had 92,000 of them. Another 20,500 are just, you know, the guy's name was William Smith on this list and Billy Smith on this list. Same social security, birth date, address, just different first names so the computers didn't check it. Uh, there's one lady on there who was 130 years old. Um, she's been on the smuckers jar a couple times. And so uh, you had about 30 people in the Sumter jail who registered to vote. You had 300 kids, uh, 300 college students at one address and, and another uh, register. So, this has absolutely nothing to do with voter ID. This is about the integrity of the election process. Voter ID stands whether they find a single dead person voting or not. Um, but we have asked them to look at the dead people voting. I have also asked SLED to look at um, the 90 some odd thousand people who have left South Carolina, uh, registered in another state, but are still in the voter rolls here. And I said, I want to know over the last several election cycles, how many of them voted in, in South Carolina? And I want you to go to the state from which they, from which they currently uh, hail from and find out how many elections they voted and see if they're voting in the same two separate states in the same election. I, I would like to know that. And we could, that, that's a very easy thing. It just, it's very time consuming. 90,000 is a lot. But that's one of the things we're doing with that. But we plan to um, sue the Justice Department on this. Supreme Court has already upheld this for Indiana. Same similar law in Indiana, photo ID. Um, um, in the Indiana case, it was upheld by the Supreme Court and the Justice Department approved this for Georgia. So there's Justice uh, Department approval precedent and their Supreme Court precedent. Whether you agree with either one of them on this case, they both said the exact opposite in previous cases. So we're going we're gonna to hold their feet to the fire on that. Uh, let's see, talk about voter ID, immigration, uh, I'm trying to think what else is going on. We've got a lot of, lot of big cases going on right now. Next month I'm going to be in D.C. for the Supreme Court for the health care arguments. Obviously y'all have all heard about the contraception issue. Um, this is my last thought and I'm going to sit down because I know you only gave me five minutes and I've gone over that. The contraception thing makes me sick to my stomach. I think it's disgusting, and I think it's, I think it's, I don't even have the words for it, but I will say this. At first, they said an individual, that, that they had an unconstitutional um, mandate to require an individual <coughs> to go get health insurance, to buy a product they may or may not want, to enter into a contract with an insurance company. That was, that was strike one. Strike two was, well, we're going to require employers to provide insurance services that they may or may not find unconscionable, that they may, that may violate their, their religious beliefs. And then in an effort to accommodate, they said, well, we're not going to require the employer to provide um, the insurance product. We're going to require the employer to provide the insurance, and then we're going to mandate that the insurance company uh, give the product away for free. So what is that? We've gone from requiring people to go into insurance, enter insurance, insurance contracts, then you've gone into requiring businesses to provide services they don't want, and now you're requiring the insurance companies to give away free stuff. I'm not here to defend the insurance companies. A lot of good ones, a lot of bad ones. But if they can force an insurance company to give away free health care or a free product, they can require Shoney's to give away a free breakfast on the street. They, they, can, they, can, they can, I mean, there are hungry people out there. We should all, we all have a Christian duty to go out and help them. But you don't have a right to force businesses to give away free meals. And I can tell you right now, I want to teach the Obama administration one, one principle that any D student in Economics 101 in college has already figured out. There are no free lunches. Let's get around the clock. Uh, so, um, I'm, I'm happy to 
I'm jumping on the conference call after this meeting to meet with several AGs who are we're going to file a complaint on that one too. And um, that those are some three hot button issues. I could go into a lot more. There's a lot of stuff under the surface that I'm dealing with that you don't see. A lot of stuff you will eventually know about. But we, we're 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 in a lot of different things. But I just want to thank you for having me. I don't want to take up your time. So um, I guess people ask questions after she's finished speaking. Well, well look, what, this, this, uh, do some questions now while you're up here. Okay. Real quick. Uh, how many elections do you have to miss before your name is removed from the... I believe it's two presidential election cycles. I read to two presidential election cycles. Yeah, but they don't actually do that. No, no. Listen, the system... I've taken two issues. And, like, the folks that are against photo ID, they're going to say, if, if they find out that the 900 dead people didn't exist, which they're, I'm sure there are quite a few on there, but let's say they, they there's not enough on there, I'm going to tell them... That, that, that's a separate issue. That's a, you got an antiquated system where you don't have DMV, the Department of Vital Statistics, the Election Commission, all talking. There needs to be some type of standard procedure whereby the, the list are expunged. And y'all saw the USA Today article. It's like 1.8 million dead people still on the voting rolls. We have to, we have to, up, we have to fix our, our system of voting. That has nothing to do with voter ID. By the way, one add-on. What they don't tell you is if an old person shows up who's got lung cancer and kidney failure, they don't have a drive, they've never had a driver's license in 92 years, they can still vote. They just have to sign an affidavit under pain of perjury and have a witness that they are who they say they are and they live at that address, and that way you can track them down in the future. They can still vote. I know, uh, I've, I'm a poll sitter, and we had a lot of problems with people coming in saying that they had registered. Um, were these people that you knew, or they just no, were they the people were, you found suspect? I, 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 I am a poll sitter in a part of town that I come from. I, I speak frequently with uh, Director Schwedo, Kevin Schwedo, who's over the DMV, and I'll be happy to bring that to his attention. Um, are, you, are you thinking that the system's broken at DMV as well? So right. It, that's where it's broken. Um, okay. The election commission will tell you that you know, they're supposed to, DMV's supposed to notify the election commission. The election commission says, you know, when we call them. No, we, you know, nobody says anything to us about these folks registering or moving or anything else, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's supposed to be done automatically. If you go change your driver's license to the address, then they notify the voter registration folks and they send you a new card. Well, well DMV will claim that they have been notified the election commission. The election commission will complain okay, that they federal they law doesn't allow them to take people off until those certain criteria are met. It's very, it's very strict, and it's, it's antiquated, and it's backdated, and it's needs so to be resolved. Yes, sir? This is a totally different question. Why can't something be done for the people that are on Medicaid that are getting all this money, spending on junk food? Why don't we put them to work, let them do voluntary work to earn what they have? Why don't we? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I mean, good question. I mean, I'm, I'm not at, that would be a... a that, that, that's the legislative branch. I, I fully support it. I, listen, I have a Medicaid fraud unit in my office. I mean, you won't believe the millions of dollars in Medi Medicaid abuse we, we deal with every year. Um, patient patient uh, recipient fraud, doctors abusing, um, patients abusing. I mean, it's, it's a hard, the system has got a lot of fraud in it. So, I mean, we're going after them on the law enforcement side, but on the, on the legislative side, I would, I would stand up next to any member of Congress or House member, or member or senator and say amen to that. Yes, sir. Alan, my question is, people who are on welfare, unemployment, why can they not be drug tested? Um, when I got my job working for the state, uh, the first time, not when I got elected, I'm talking when I was an assistant attorney general, I showed up to fill out my application. They said, by the way, you have to go over to, and you have to pee in a cup, and you get your fingerprint <laughs> and all that stuff. I was, I, was, I was applying to be a prosecutor. But if I go over and I apply to, to receive a government entitlement, a benefit, then I don't have to prove that I'm not smoking crack or smoking pot or whatever. It's, it's funny, the standard, we're, we're making prosecutors and cops submit the drug te uh, test to, uh, to enforce the law, but we're not requiring people who are receiving that benefit do the same. I, I never understood why that was, and I've actually asked that question of people, and I'd like to see it change. Who, well, I guess you say, presents the law? Who puts it on the books? How do we get it done? What's the bottom line? We know it needs to be done. How do we do it? Well, you just go to your, your house member, 
uh, your, your, your state house member or senator and you ask them to do it, or you go to the one that you have the best relationship with, whether they're yours or not, and you say, hey, listen, this is an idea. And um, you know what I'm going to do? I, I've got a couple of friends that I'm going to see later today, and I'm going to talk to them about that. Um, because that's something that's come up a lot. Please do. Yeah, it's but, very but, important. But listen, I'm going I'm to check on it for you. But, but listen, y'all got as much power as I do. Because, I mean, when y'all come together, talking to these members of the House, they listen to you. I've heard about this breakfast a lot. I mean, y'all are well known. <laughs> uh, but what I'm saying is y'all have had Kenny Bing and Rick Quinn and others come here and talk. I mean, seriously, put, push that issue. Push that. It's a good issue. I agree with you. Any, any? No, likewise. Let me throw one quick question. You know, we talk about how we have to get Justice Department pretty clear and solve a lot of our voting issues. What steps can we take to ultimately get out of that? Because my understanding is there's only, what, about 11 states that are required to do this via the Voting Rights Act. How does that hold up to one a constitutional muster, and, and how could that be ultimately changed? Or could it? Well, he, he wants to nullify it. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gaddix. I have played in years.